Hi, and welcome back to Internal Error, where we dive deep into some of the most captivating, mysterious, and often horrifying stories and tales from around the world. Today, we take you back to June 19, 1918, to the peaceful farmlands of Grand Prairie, Alberta, where a series of chilling events unfolded, leading to the largest mass murder in Alberta's history. It all began on a quiet night when Dan Lowe, a recent transplant from Illinois, was roused from his sleep by a strange sound coming from his neighbor's farm. Probably just a dream, he thought, exhausted from the day. He'd spent the afternoon helping his neighbors, the Snyders, put boots on their young colt who needed the extra leg protection while training. Dan had purchased his new farm some 20 miles north of Grand Prairie from a fellow named Charles Zimmer just a few months back. He was eager to get roots down in the area by helping out his new neighbors. As he lay in bed, he heard the noise again, but now it seemed to be coming from his child's room. He got up to check, and while comforting his daughter, Dan noticed an unusual flicker of light out of the window and strained to hear cries coming from the Snyder's farmhouse. It wasn't a dream. Help, help, he heard a voice cry. A gruff, angry voice replied, but Lowe couldn't tell for sure what was said. The unknown reply wasn't spoken by old Joseph Snyder or his nephew Stanley. Lowe was sure of it. Although he hadn't known his neighbors for long, he was familiar enough with their Eastern European accents. Then he heard a deep, sorrowful groan that seemed to go on forever before gradually fading away. Realizing the urgency of the situation, Lowe decided to check on his neighbors. He quickly put on his trousers, woke his wife Anne to tell her where he was heading, and hurried outside, sprinting the 500 yards to the Snyder farm. As he neared the house, the horrifying sight of flames engulfing the building met him. Panicking, he debated his next move. Should he rush into the burning house to save his neighbors or seek help? Dan decided to get the police. On his way back to his own farm, Dan stumbled into a bog and got stuck. Freeing himself and saddling up his horse, he rode to the Alberta Provincial Police Office in Grand Prairie, reaching it around 4 a.m. The police, led by Corporal William Allen, quickly returned with Dan to the Snyder farm, only to find a gruesome scene. The farmhouse was nearly destroyed by the fire, with drag marks and bloodstains leading to the charred remains of the building. Inside, they discovered the burned body of Joseph Snyder and his nephew Stanley on the roof. An autopsy confirmed the cause of death for both men, shot with a 38 caliber revolver. Stanley had been shot behind his left ear, and his uncle Joseph had been shot under his left eye. The revolver was found at the crime scene with five spent shells still in the gun. The general consensus among the Alberta police was that this was a murder-suicide, but the residents of the area believed the police had made a hasty decision. Three days later, their suspicions would be confirmed when four more bodies were discovered at the farm of Ignace Payton. Inside the house, police found the bodies of Payton himself and his friend James Woodwand. German trapper Charles Zimmer was discovered in a wagon on the property, his head sticking out from under sacks of flour and sugar piled on his body. Frank Parzachowski, a Ukrainian blacksmith from North Dakota, was also discovered outside, lying on his back. Peyton's throat was slashed, but the rest of the men had been shot. Like the gun found at the Snyder's, a 38 caliber revolver was the weapon used in the murders. The gun was later proven to be Ignace Peyton's. Considering the state of decomposition of the four bodies, the 38 caliber revolver discovered at the Snyder place, and the five spent shell casings found in the gun, it was reasonable to conclude that the same perpetrator was responsible for all six murders. The killer had visited the Peyton farm before making his way to the Snyders. As the investigation deepened, suspicion fell on Dan Lowe. His presence at the Snyder farm the night of the murders, coupled with circumstantial evidence, made him a prime suspect. But Dan had his own account. He claimed he rushed to help after hearing cries and went to the police instead of seeking help from neighbors because it seemed the most logical option at the time. Dan was arrested and faced trial in December 1920. He had, in truth, known that Peyton, Woodwand, and Zimmer had withdrawn substantial amounts of money from the Union Bank in Grand Prairie on June 18th, with an estimated total of $3,700. $70,000 in today's money. The trio was preparing for a 300-mile journey to Fort Vermilion to purchase a ranch, hence the readied and loaded wagon in Peyton's yard. 
It appeared that Parzachowski was merely collateral damage, as he had dropped by that evening to have a drink with his buddies before they departed the next morning. Despite the flimsy evidence, and the fact that he had no motive, the case against Dan Lowe moved forward. However, his defense attorney, Martin Egar, pointed out the numerous flaws and lack of concrete evidence in the prosecution's case. Furthermore, Lowe's wife, Anne, had backed her husband's story. Unfortunately, Anne and the couple's youngest child had succumbed to the Spanish flu in 1918, and her testimony couldn't be verified. The jury took less than an hour to declare Dan Lowe not guilty. He was released, but the shadow of suspicion never fully left him. Soon after, Dan and his remaining children left Alberta, returning to Illinois. The police also considered other suspects, including local veterans and bootleggers, but no charges were ever brought against anyone else. The case remains one of the province's most baffling mysteries. To this day, the true events of that night in 1918 remain unsolved, a haunting chapter in Alberta's history. What really happened? Who was responsible for the brutal murders of those six men? Let us know in the comments what you think happened that fateful night. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more intriguing stories from the past. See you next time.